Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm O'Connor Whiteley, bringing you psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. Here where I can find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and here where I can get your free 8 psychology book box set at ConnorWhiteley.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 172 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Colin Whiteley. And today's episode is on What are the signs of infidelity? And it is the 1st of October 2022 as I record this. So today's episode, I actually wanted to change it up a little bit because I'll talk more about this in the personal update, but the next three weeks, um, or well, of podcast episodes, episodes, I'm actually doing it in advance, though, because next week, I'm actually going away, well, slightly, but also not at the same time. But anyway, so I wasn't quite sure when this episode was, it was actually going to pop up. That's because it's so interesting, and also because some of the topics and some of the content we actually talk about are quite like, why would you do that to someone? Or like, why do you think that that would work? And some of them, I mean, are just so dumb. This is just such a brilliant, really interesting podcast episode that actually dives into infidelity and cheating behaviour. Something we've never really covered on the podcast before. So I know that you're going to love today's episode. So moving on to the psychology news section, we're reading from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And there's some good ones here today. For example, the first one is, Can listening to white noise help you focus? I use a white noise to help me um, to sleep. And according to the results of a new study in scientific reports, I should use it to help me at work as well. White noise a noise that contains equal amounts of all of the sound frequencies that we can hear. Since at least 2007, research has suggested that it, that it can boost memory and attention levels of children di- diagnosed with ADHD. However, relatively little work has been done done on neurotypical people, and the few studies that have been conducted have produced mixed results. So, Mohamed Awa at the University of Southern California and her colleagues set out to run a comprehensive investigation on the effects of a white noise on cognition using two different volumes of a white noise and a broad battery of cognitive tests. So I won't dive into the uh, results and the nitty gritty of it, but the idea of uh, listening to white noise is actually rather interesting because of course white noise from yeah from white noise it literally doesn't sound of anything well it does but it's all sort of like static and whatnot so um, it's a quite interesting that the findings show that that can help you to a study and it that can actually help you to a focus so well, that's rather interesting I guess another takeaway from this uh, is that a researcher that focuses more on the clinical side, uh, for example, neurodivergent people, is interesting to see when their results and studies and results from traditionally their point of view can actually be applied to neurotypical people. And I, I guess that this just uh, goes to show that in research and as um, psychologists and uh, academics, we all need to be looking for a like as holistic approach as a, and, uh, yeah, well, uh, as uh, possible at times when it's appropriate. Because if a research was never done in that neurotypical people listening to white noise, then uh, we wouldn't actually have these really good like 
episodes now, so it's interesting. And I guess that sometimes the psychology news articles they are a bit more abstract because, yes, you could listen to white noise, but personally, I don't, I just don't think that I would. But it's interesting in the slight take a step back and actually like, look at this from a research point of the Vivo and like see if there are any themes that we could apply to other areas. So the second one is People are more skeptical of sex different research when finding favourite males. Yes, and I've actually got a, 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 a story about this in a minute. Research into sex differences gets a lot of publicity and it can be very controversial. On the one hand, science has historically cast women in a negative light, with poorly evidenced claims about apparent differences between men and women. Research debunking these myths is therefore noteworthy. On the other, some work has drawn out differences that previously ignored have harmed women. For example, medical research has often seen male patients as the default subject to be tested, which has led to adverse reactions to a medication in women. So, whilst many people very reasonably are suspicious of research on sex differences, some of it provides useful information. It's therefore important to know how people engage with and respond to this kind of work. Now, a new study has found that people have a consistent aversion to research favouring males, especially when that research is authored by men. And that's exactly what I actually want to mention on, because um, Psychology Today, absolutely brilliant website, well, well, website a while back, something on their Facebook page like it popped up for me, and it was something about um, male porn behaviour habits. Yeah, watching it, and I was like sitting there, and I was thinking, well, I've not got anything like better to do, so I, I might as well like, look at what the research says. And it was offered by a like, male, and normally I never look at social media comments. I literally just don't, because I tend to find social media these days just so up in the air and so negative. Uh, there's, yeah, but like, there's often like no point. But this time I actually did. So there was a like, woman who who actually pointed it out, but this is written by a man, and there was a comment under it which I which I which I actually found quite interesting because it yeah because it was sort of because he made a good point and this is and now I'm actually gonna say it it sounds a bit controversial but to be honest what he was saying was uh, was that. Uh, was that just because it was authored by a man that doesn't make the research bad. But then he also made like another point which I won't get into because I'm not sure I completely agree with it. But then he actually said that well it's not acceptable in our society if I um, meant to call out women um, research, research as bad just because it's written by a woman. So why is it right for the woman to call out that male research bad just because it's like written by a male? And I do see like where he's coming from. So this is very controversial. This is a very hot topic. But to be honest, I think the key things that we need to take away are Research that favours males If it is good at research, then not we need to accept it And that is a completely okay for like men to do research that favours men as long as the research is not biased What happens historically to women is flat out wrong 
and it is a good that we are compensating for it, and we are trying to reverse the damaging stereotypes and myths, and finally, we all just need to work like together more to try and promote gender, well, gender equality more. So, the last one is autistic children with imaginary friends have a better social skills, just like the neurotypical children. Imaginary or pretend play in a, in a childhood is important. It offers opportunities for social interaction as well as the chance to learn how to understand social signals and the minds of others. A common form of a pretend play is the, is the creation of an imaginary friend, and research with neurotypical children has found that children with imaginary friends tend to show better understanding of the mental and emotional states of others. Greater focus on the mental state of friends and superior communication skills. Autism has been associated with a deficit in both pretend play and social skills, but Paige Davis and her colleagues have found that although autistic children are less inclined to create imaginary friends, when they do create them, they are similar to those of neurotypical children in terms of their social attributes. For example, mental states, personality traits, a point of function, and a gender. Now, what Davis and her team have examined whether autistic children who have a imaginary friend also experience the social benefits seen amongst neurotypical children. So, like, again, I won't go into the detail. Like, any more, yeah, well, like, any more than to the ins and outs and the results of it. But as we uh, can see the light from the headline, like, it does uh, produce very, uh, um, it does uh, produce very good uh, benefits for autistic children. So, but there's actually not a lot to that I can actually say about this one. I guess if it's that uh, good that, um, some autistic children can uh, create a, like, imaginary friends and it's so uh, good that we also have the research that uh, supports and actually shows that there are benefits to them. So all of them very interesting and very good. So I hope you enjoy the psychology news section. So let's move on to the person update. So we're moving on to the person update. So well, this week has been like my first full well, week like, back down at university and it was quite interesting. Well like I'm not sure that some people but I can like, agree with uh, me here that the first week, first week in a bit at university always tends to be a bit uh, Basic and a bit of a waste of time, <laughs> which makes me sound terrible, like a terrible student. But as because it's all the introductory stuff, it all does sort of feel like a waste of a time though, because my cogn was my cognition in action lecture, my applied psychology lecture, my clinical psychology one, and that's all weather I've had like this a week. I could have learned all of that from slides. So I did not need to spend the hour driving there and back and everything and the trauma that came along um, with it. I'm not going to say what it was, but oh, <laughs> I thought I was actually going to die twice. Oh, not fun. Motorway driving. Dangerous stuff. Especially when there are you know, silly people on the road. So anyway, so there was some more like EEG training to though, and that's about it that we for like this week. But I really am looking forward to, to actually getting into university properly and for yes, and to actually start learning stuff. That will be nice. 
better precise than that. It's sort of like all systems go like in my house at the moment because my parents are going away on a holiday for their wedding anniversary. But because we're getting our bathroom done, I have to like move out and like live with my granddad there for like two weeks. So, so well, that would be really good and I am uh, looking forward to it. But it will mean now that I'm away from my recording studio for my audio booth for those two weeks. So I'm doing the other two podcasts in advance. But we are covering from absolute brilliant episodes. And I know that I personally am really, really looking forward to them. And as always, I always love to hear your thoughts and feelings on uh, today's episode. So, so you can always email me, conwiley, conwiley.net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at conwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci fi wiley. Or leave a comment on the Facebook post at Connor Whiteley Psychology Author. I always love to hear from you because it really helps make the podcast feel more like a conversation. And today's episode has been sponsored by Psychology of Relationships, the social psychology of friendships, romantic relationships, and more. Fourth edition, because we've got a brilliant, brilliant, brand new fourth edition, which I absolutely love because we're covering some brand new topics. It's been updated quite a bit, and then just so many new, brand new topics. Uh, the Bob, which I've actually been dying at, like um, research, so uh, and one of the biggest, uh, like. Brand new um, topics is sexuality. So it looks at like what makes people were straight, and then it also looks into the rather limited theories on homosexuality. So they're really interesting. Um, yeah, but like in like trust them. Well, but then tons of other um, topics have also been like updated, uh, like why of relationships like changing end. A lot of the proper social behaviour stuff uh, has also been um, updated. So there are so many great topics and I really do love for this brand new edition. In fact, I do just love um, introducing new editions like, as a whole. And like, uh, to be honest, uh, the uh, social psychology book has also received uh, um, a like, massive update. I think it's I think the social psychology book, that's, you know, that fourth physician is like 20,000 more words there. So definitely check out both of them. Both of them, I had a blast writing, and they are just such a brilliant, like, new content. So definitely check that out. So that is the psychology of relationships. The social psychology of friendships, romantic relationships, and more. A fourth edition. Available from all major ebook retailers, and you can order the paperback and the hardback versions from Amazon, your local bookstore, or local library if you request it. So, right now, the personal update is done. Let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we'll move on to the content part of uh, today's episode. So we're going to be looking at what are the signs of infidelity. And I think this is just such a great uh, episode. And just to uh, introduce uh, this like, topic. As we all know though, like, when it uh, comes uh, to this uh, unfortunate side of uh, human relationships, we all would like to think that we're amazing at detecting deception, lies, and any manipulations that our loved ones do try to use against us. But it turns out in reality, all of us have been fooled once, twice, or a lot more because we haven't picked up on the signs that our partner and our loved ones have been cheating on us. So, uh, this does raise the question of uh, what are the signs of infidelity? 
and most importantly, what are the strategies that cheating a people use it to deceive their partners? And that's the focus of today's episode. So, Strategies of Deception by Alice Ponzo and all in 2022. A new study aims at to examine these strategies and the results of the study that I've just said are very interesting from a social psychological standpoint. Yes, I will definitely admit that from a human viewpoint, these are a little sad and we are just like going to say on the positive. Therefore, what the study found was that there were 53 acts, uh, acts that people engage in to hide their cheating from their partners, as well as 11 infidelity hiding strategies that both men and women use. Then, out of these 11 strategies used, uh, used by both sexes, the findings showed over 70% of participants were in their client as clients used at least 7 of them, with the researchers noting that a combination of them is often needed to hide their cheating behaviour and counter their partner's detection strategies. In addition, in that terms of detection strategies, as Ponzo and Diniano, 2021, found that people use 47 different acts to detect if their partner is a cheating on them. And the 2022 study noted that several of these infidelity hiding strategies are designed to counter the strategies that their own partners use to detect the cheating behaviour. And the really interesting thing about this is that in theory, yeah, this sounds perfectly logical. Because of the course, if you're going to do something wrong, then you will then you will want to go out of your way to hide it. But in reality, this can actually make um, the cheating a lot easier to detect. What are the signs of infidelity? Here are the top four groups of fire strategies that had that cheating partners used to hide their infidelity. Firstly, yeah, the most common secret strategy to hide cheating behaviour in the study was the idea of that less is more, or being discreet. As you can imagine, this often involved meeting people in private, secluded areas, and making sure by that their current partners couldn't get hold of them, as well as the researcher noted that using this discretion results in the people wanting to avoid leaving physical evidence of infidelity. So it makes the real partners who will want to spy on their cheating partners more difficult for them to do that. Secondly, and leading on from the first group of strategies, is that the concept of Show me the evidence. Because that with the cheating partner getting rid of, well, rid of the physical evidence, this uh, can itself create a, a lot of questions. For example, I don't know about you, but I haven't, but I haven't wiped my um my like search history in years, and I don't delete texts. So, if I had a partner, and they looked at my um, search history, what they find is that I have an empty search history, and that I've deleted a lot of my texts, then uh, this will suddenly look very suspicious. Well, well, suspicious, because why has my behaviour and the habits changed all of a sudden? Or another example, but could say be that I'm sure that your phone 
is filled with feathers and emails and everything else so that help me get constantly. Like on my phone, the romantic uh, groups of uh, pictures in my uh, gallery. So, again, if there are um, suddenly large uh, gaps in uh, my uh, gallery, then uh, this help would look uh, suspicious uh, because I'm breaking uh, my behavioural habits for seemingly no, uh, well, no uh, reason. Furthermore, the next group of first strategies that uh, that are referred to popular, popular but are termed stability suppresses suspicion. And I think this is a very interesting group, group but due to the research noted uh, that people uh, people use uh, strategies uh, to hide their cheating by uh, keeping the same routines and keeping the same behaviour. These uh, methods in the of cheaters making an effort to avoid changing their habits, routines and attitudes towards their partners, along with their appearance. And it turns out that these strategies could, uh, could uh, be very effective in their, in their real life, uh, because normally yeah, it is the changing of a person's look or behaviour within an already established relationship that causes the other partner to become suspicious. Finally, the fourth group of, of the strategies that people use to hide cheating behaviour, and this is a very, very dumb strategy in my opinion, is that the cheater becomes suddenly a smitten. That's such an old word. <laughs> with uh, a partner, and I uh, mean uh, seriously, that will only end up arousing the sea suspicion, uh, but yeah, it's their relationship, <laughs> do what you want, if you think that's a great idea, do it. The idea behind this strategy is that cheaters are trying to camouflage their cheating by expressing a lot more love and interest in their partners. But as the researcher pointed out, however, this strategy is a very vulnerable to what we mentioned above, with the observed changes in their behaviour, because by trying to hide their cheating behaviour, the cheater might be... Um, giving us uh, signals of their unfaithfulness. Nevertheless, I suppose I should sort of back it by some uh, credit to cheaters, uh, big, or, uh, cheaters and uh, because this uh, strategy is uh, so flawed, but the researcher did note how that this is rarely used at only 46% of uh, people using it. But to be honest, that's still quite a lot. 46% of cheaters use that strategy. That's still a lot, and that's just silly, in my um, opinion. Due to some uh, partners, I will uh, take this increase of romantic interest uh, as an increase in how much their partner loves them, which is a massive shame. Signs of infidelity and Machiavellianism. Love that word. Personally, I always love to dip into a personality psychology whenever I can. So, but for the last section of the uh, podcast episode, I uh, wanted to mention a uh, little finding from this uh, study on ascending personality since the researchers found that Machiavellianism, which as a reminder to everyone, is uh, described as uh, being manipulative, exploitative and deceitful towards others, is a significant predictor of infidelity. With a deceptive strategy in including directly lying to the non-cheating partner, and one manipulation strategy includes expressing love 
threat towards the non cheating partner to assure their partner of their devotion to them, despite them cheating on the partner. Conclusion Personally, I'm actually rather surprised that, that there is a, a useful takeaway from that today's episode. Of course, it's an unofficial piece of advice, but I still rather like it. Therefore, in terms of dating, it is as a, it is a probably best as best as to take things slow and to make sure you get to know them carefully at the beginning of a relationship, so that you are able to separate sheer attraction. Because, like, believe me, I you know that certain people are both very attractive from a character, character, because that is what is actually most important thing. So what you can see the sort of people they are, and if they're the sort of uh, person that to uh, give you authentic um, adoration rather than manipulations and the other red flags that follow a lot sooner rather than later because I truly don't want that for any of you. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and, uh, and that you got something out of it. I like know that I did, and I always think about these episodes, uh, even though they're slightly off the beaten track, well, to like some I guess, and, and at least for the podcast, I uh, you know that they are like, useful and they are, and to be honest, that they are actually rather interesting. So, if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help us spread the words eh, about the uh, podcast. And definitely check out uh, Psychology of our Relationships, the Social Psychology of uh, Friendships, Romantic relationships, pro social behaviour, and more. Fourth edition. Gotta check out this a brand new edition. I loved it. But if you didn't want to buy a book, but you still need to give the podcast a bit of like one time support, then definitely check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash con whitely. So have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. And if you want a free eight book psychology box set, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.